Okay, good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Let's pray and uh, we'll get started for today. Let me just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for a very blessed weekend that was. And Lord, your presence in our lives. And Father God, for the opportunity to worship you, Lord. And Father, even as we start off the week, Lord, and uh, uh, engage in your word, help us, Lord, to grow more. And help us, oh God, to increase in the grace of God in every every way, Father God. And Lord, we especially ask, Lord, that you will bless this session and bring insights to our hearts, Lord, from the life of Apostle Paul. We bless you. We honor you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, we continue with our study in the book of Acts. We've completed uh, till Acts chapter 8. And we saw how the early church began to thrive. There were volunteers in the early church. We looked at the fact that in Acts 6, there was a need for a change in the governance of the church. They needed an additional set of people called as the, um, you know, or rather the volunteers. And so the volunteers come into the picture and they are serving in matters wherever required. These volunteers we saw in Acts 7, it was about Stephen and he was such a mighty man uh, in the Lord, a one performing signs, wonders, at the same time very uh, well grounded in the word of God. He was able to give an explanation to his opposers even when he was being persecuted. And we went on to see about Philip. Philip in uh, Acts 8. He again being one of the volunteers, served God with all his heart. We saw how uh, God used him mightily. He was an evangelist and the Holy Spirit was leading him. We saw the instructions that God gave Philip. It came through, um, uh, you know, initially... He goes to Samaria and from there an angel directs him to go to uh, you know, the, the road to Gaza and over there he meets an Ethiopian eunuch and from there he's supernaturally transported. Now we do not talk too much about the way in which God told him to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch. So the point where he's asked to go meet the eunuch is where he receives a prompting from the Holy Spirit. He gets these words in his spirit, go overtake the chariot. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to bring our attention to God's instruction to Philip. This is something we did not cover, which is why I'm uh, discussing it today. Go overtake the chariot. It was a simple instruction from God and he followed it. So as we follow the simple instructions of God, we discussed in the last class that God was actually calling him to impact a very influential person in the history of Africa, but he had no idea. But how did God lead him into this? Through a very simple instruction. It was but a sentence or a phrase in his spirit where God told him, go and overtake the chariot. Okay, So uh, this is a reminder for each of us to follow God, no matter what he's telling us. And it may seem like uh, something very, very easy to do. But in that, God can be accomplishing a powerful work for his kingdom. So we saw how Philip is traveling throughout the region uh, and he is bringing people to Christ. We also saw how, according to the pattern of the early church, once there were believers in Samaria, what are the steps that they were uh, following every time they had believers? What was the next step? When people accept Christ, what was the next step? Baptism, water baptism. And then Holy Spirit baptism. So that is the pattern everywhere we see that. So who came to Samaria to minister? Yeah, Philip came initially. People started believing. Who came after that? 
correct peter and john the leaders of the church they came they ministered baptism in the holy spirit and who was the personality who was ready to give them money yeah simon the sorcerer so he wanted to give money but uh, uh, peter and john peter rebukes him okay uh, and what did we see now that the gospel had spread to that place there is a statement given there about samaria once the gospel came there correct very good very good so uh, i'm glad you are listening <laughs> all the answers are correct uh, so there was joy in the city and as we do god's work there will be joy in the city so till now we have seen the emergence of the apostles we've seen the engagement of the volunteers we've seen how mighty these volunteers were spiritually and now we will look at what are the other things that are happening during this intense period of persecution so let's begin at acts chapter 9 and verse 1 there's an introduction to this individual saul where did we read about saul just earlier stephen's martyrdom so he seems to be the leader who was uh, who who was uh, consenting to the killing of stephen so we read about him there and uh, we also saw how persecution increased acts 8 remember we said they went house to house they were dragging people out men and women putting them in the prison so persecution was spreading throughout the region saul is a very active persecutor now we may ask the question why he is in general a passionate person we will see that so he was passionate about his faith in judaism and uh, somewhere he had the understanding that those who are following christ are making a mistake so which is why he was passionately persecuting them so starting here at acts 9 verse 1 we see that saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the lord so that was his goal to actually uh, not just intimidate them but also kill them it says murder so you can imagine what extent he was going as we move on in verse 2 he had asked for letters from the high priest to go to the synagogues of damascus so that is talking about a formal permission he took from the high priest to go and persecute people in damascus so everything is official he's not doing anything without the approval of the authorities and then we read on so that if he found any who were of the way what is this the way right so up until now we don't see the believers in christ having a name the group having a name as such for the first time here in acts 9 they are referred to as the way so we don't know how and why they were called the way but they're called the way so those who are part of the way are christians or believers so he wanted to uh, find those who are of the way whether men or women that he might bring them bound to jerusalem so that is his intention he has an agenda and he is moving towards damascus with an official permission what happens on the road to damascus you know we talk about the encounter on the road to damascus and that's what is going to take place now so verse 3 he journeyed he came near damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven so he's having what we call as an encounter he's a persecutor he's not even seeking christ can a persecutor somebody who's opposing the gospel have an encounter with the lord 
Yes, that's what we can see here. God can touch anybody's life. We've already understood what a serious persecutor he is. But God is encountering him. Now let's read how this encounter happened. Verse 4, as soon as he sees a bright light which was shown around him, he fell to the ground. In other narrations of Paul, we'll understand that this was during the daytime. Okay? And we are talking about Damascus, which is in uh, the, the Middle Eastern region, you could say. So how are the days in the Middle East? Very bright. Very bright, isn't it? Though the day was bright, what did Paul experience? A light which shone around him from heaven. A brighter light. Brighter light. So what kind of an experience was, would that have been? We can only imagine bright light. Brighter than the Middle Eastern sun. It was something different. It was not normal. So no wonder he was shaken up and he fell to the ground. And when he fell to the ground, he also heard a voice. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let's just pause on what this voice is saying. Saul, 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 Saul. Whenever there is a repetition, it's God's way of emphasizing, verily, verily, I say unto you. Or, you know, any other name, Martha, Martha. So God is, uh, God is making a point when he's repeating the name. Here, he could have just said Saul. But the way of writing, whenever for Saul, Saul, there is an emphasis. That means that God we could understand, was very intentional in reaching out to Saul. It was not a mistake. No, it was not like, okay, uh, I'll, just, I, I'll just have an encounter with anybody. No, it was, you could say, targeted at Saul. So when God saw him on the road to Damascus, that was the timing. And he said, Saul, Saul. God is intentional intentional look at the remaining part why are you persecuting who do you find something different about that what yeah isn't it jesus could have said and we'll see later that the voice god jesus introduces himself but why did he say, why are you persecuting me? The people were the ones who were being persecuted. But this also brings to our mind that any persecution against God's people, how does God see it? How does he feel about it? As if he is being persecuted. Isn't that encouraging? That he doesn't forget, forget us. We are always before him. And any persecution to us is persecution to him. He's saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you recall at the time when uh, Stephen was martyred? What did we say? Jesus was standing in heaven, welcoming him, honoring the martyr. So it gives us an understanding of how God views those who are being persecuted. His heart goes out to them. In fact, he takes it personally. And he's saying, why? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And as soon as Saul heard this voice, he knew that this was not normal or it's not a human being. So in verse 5, the response of Saul is, who are you, Lord? Already he's saying, Lord, because it's a heavenly encounter. And he recognized that. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. Again, notice that. You're persecuting me. You're persecuting Jesus. When you're persecuting the people of Jesus. And uh, he also says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So this uh, goads, it's, it's like a, uh, a rest, restraint on the legs of uh, cattle. So they used to they used to put that, and it was difficult for the cattle to kind of you know uh, to kick it out and move away. So it's like God saying that I am going to direct you, Paul, and you cannot you cannot escape. You cannot do your own thing. Something is going to happen where you need to follow me. It's going to be difficult for you to kick against the goats. It was as if God is saying. I'm going to direct you from now onwards. So I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, and it is hard for you to kick against the code. So when he told that, uh, Paul or Saul would have understood that this is what God is intending. Now, verse 6, as soon as he hears this, trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Imagine. In one moment, till now, he was persecuting, he was killing, he has taken an official letter to go and kill the people in Damascus. Jesus has introduced himself from heaven. I am Jesus. Something happened in a moment. Paul could have said, okay, Jesus, like explain yourself to me further. Why are you talking to me like this? Nothing. Verse 6, trembling, meaning he re recognized that this is the truth. This is God who's speaking to me. So that sense of reverence. Remember when we look at Isaiah, Isaiah, he sees, uh, you know, uh, the, the train of God's robe. He has an encounter with the Lord and God wants him to serve his purposes. What was Isaiah's response? I'm a, he says, no, I, I am a mere man. Lord, how can I? He just humbles himself in the presence of God. So whenever we encounter God, seems like there's always this realization of who we are. And so Paul is trembling and astonished. Oh, this is God. And uh, he's a holy God. And God's presence brings a great awareness of who God is and who we are. So he's not questioning, he's not arguing, he's not, uh, you know, sort of uh, going against what is being spoken. He immediately says, Lord, how did this man went from persecuting this Jesus to saying, Lord? A supernatural encounter. He immediately under, in that moment, in those moments of the presence of God, he knew this is God. How can I go against God? He's immediately saying, Lord, how much time does it take for God to touch the heart of a of a persecutor? Not much time. He went from persecutor to saying, Lord. Wow, what an encounter Paul had. And he is humbling himself. You remember Isaiah, he said, here I am, Lord, send me. Heart is willing. After encountering God and his presence, heart is willing and saying, whatever you want, I will do. Paul is in that place now. And he's saying, what do you want me to do? Think about that. You know, when we encounter God and God's holiness and who he is, we get an understanding of who we are. And the response we see of people is generally like this. What do you want me to do? I'll do anything what you want me to do. As I said that, Paul is saying the same thing. What do you want me to do? Then the Lord Jesus, he says to him, arise. Go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So here comes a clear instruction. How did this instruction come? God 
spoke to him so till now we have seen how god speaks to us how he leads us god spoke to philip through an angel later a prompt came from the lord in his spirit go overtake the chariot okay then after that there was a supernatural transportation god set it up for philip to be on the road towards caesarea you know he went on ministering and he went towards caesarea now how is god speaking to his people literally an audible voice god is speaking in this way but thank god we have a speaking god and there was a clear instruction you know what you have to do now saul get up go into the city you will be told what you must do so that's how god works also we want to know the full picture from god lord what do you want me to do maybe paul thought when i ask god this or jesus this i am going to get an idea of what i must do in my entire life but what did god respond with one instruction i'm not going to tell you everything for now you get up you go into the city it will be told to you there what you must do so there was a simple instruction again then there were people with him uh who were going along traveling along with Saul and it says that they journeyed with him and they stood speechless hearing a voice but seeing no one so what kind of an encounter was this this was a an encounter where the people who were journeying with Saul also heard the voice that's different think about the time when Samuel heard the audible voice of God who heard it only Samuel heard it Eli didn't hear it in this case Saul heard it the people traveling with him also heard it so why did God do that maybe God wanted the people also to take notice that this man is having a supernatural encounter so god's audible voice or god's message goes to the intended audience now we don't know if there were other people on the road and if they also heard the voice or not doesn't seem like only saul and his men heard the voice but they did not see anyone whereas uh, saul had a much more you know profound experience compared to the men around him so they didn't see anything then they take Saul so Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened he saw no one but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank so here he is this man he had an encounter he goes to Damascus with the help of these men, obviously. Reason is, when he opened his eyes, he discovered that he is blind. Why did he go blind? No idea. Actually, we don't have any idea why he went blind. Uh, could it be that the bright light affected him? You know, his natural eyes? Maybe. We don't know. We don't know what kind of, how he saw it. Did he see it in the spirit? Did he, did he uh, see it in the natural? We have no explanation for why this man went blind. But he went blind. And thankfully, his men were there with him, taking him to the city of Damascus. He is in Damascus now. And over there, what is he up to? Three days without sight. Neither ate nor drank. So it shows us that Saul was in deep thought. He was a devout Jew. Neither ate uh, nor drank could also mean that he was fasting. Because he's just had an encounter with the Lord. He doesn't know what's happening. And so it must have been his prayer to God where he's saying like, Lord, what is going on? What do you want to do with my life? So, three days, he's fasting. He's seeking the Lord after this encounter. And he does not have any sight. 
So what could he have been doing in those three days? Maybe, this is our assumption, maybe he could have been recollecting all the incidents about how he persecuted the, the people of the way. He must have thought about, uh, you know, the explanations. You remember we said he is a member of the Sanhedrin, the council. So when the apostles stood before the council, Saul also would have heard their explanations. He would have seen their lives. He would have had his own uh, understanding of why these people are the way they are. Uh, apart from this, he was there when Stephen was martyred. And he heard out Stephen's speech. So our assumption is that all this is going on in his mind for three days. Three days. And he would have been convinced about this Jesus, because he has heard a clear gospel. Stephen preached to Saul. Think about this. Before he died, Stephen has preached the clear gospel to Saul. He knows. He knows who this Jesus is. He knows what this Jesus has done. Okay, And so these are the things that are going on inside Paul's mind. And he was fully convinced about who Jesus is and what he had done for him. So we could also say that he came into the born again experience in these three days. Now, look at the way God works. It's like a movie. One scene, Paul is, is in, a, in a place waiting. He's blind. He's fasting. In another scene, God is Ministering to another person. His name is Ananias. Have we seen another Ananias earlier? Huh. Ananias, the high priest, yeah. But did we see him now? Recently? Correct. One, one of them, uh, one of the high priests is Ananias. Did we see any other Ananias up until? Correct, correct. Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, and let's not get confused. These are all different people. So this Ananias is uh, from Damascus. What else do we uh, see about this Ananias? Verse 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, so uh, beautiful, you know, God, the way he speaks to all of us. How would you like it if God called your name? You know, earlier he said, Saul, Saul. Now he's saying, Ananias, this is what we want to hear, right? I wish I could hear God say my name. So Ananias is hearing his name. How this time it's a vision. So can we see? These are different ways in God, which God is leading and guiding his people. Angel, prompting, audible voice, vision. What is the description about this man Ananias? Actually nothing much. He's called a certain disciple, which means like, a, you know, even a Philip and a Stephen were volunteers in the church. So they were volunteers. But certain disciple sounds more like one believer. That's all. Okay. Nothing more than that. A certain disciple, Ananias. But God is speaking to the certain disciple or just a believer. We could ask the question, Lord, why didn't you speak to a pastor? Why didn't you speak to an apostle? But God chooses whom he chooses to speak to. So, God is speaking to Ananias. Look at the response of Ananias. Here I am, Lord. Maybe that's why God is speaking to Ananias. Because whenever God knocks, it's possible that Ananias was that man who always opened the door. And he said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm ready to do what you want me to do. So God knew that here is a man who will respond. 
Here is a man who will do what I want him to do. Maybe that is the reason in all of Damascus, God has chosen Ananias, obedient man. He will do. Maybe something like Philip, he will do. Okay, so he calls him Ananias and the response of Ananias. Here I am, Lord, meaning I am available. So the Lord said to him, instructions, arise, go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So in a vision, all this is happening. God is speaking to Ananias. Notice, this is a word of knowledge. Okay, how is God speaking? Vision, there is a word of knowledge. What is a word of knowledge? Piece of information. And this is factual information where God is saying, I want you to go to the street called Straight. It's like saying, I want you to go to Commercial Street. I want you to go to, you know, any place. You just pick any place in Bangalore. God is giving Ananias the address. Amazing. Is it possible for God to give somebody's address if he wants us to go meet them? Why not? He gave the address to Ananias. He said, go to this address, street called Straight, and ask at the house of Judas. Isn't that the address? Address God gave him in a vision. So today, as we try to hear from the Lord, is it possible for us to get contact details of people? If God wants to give us, we can. If God wants to minister to someone, why not? He may show us where they are so that we can go and help them. So God can speak to us. So in a word of knowledge, we, we may receive even contact information. Then he tells him, this man, Saul of Tarsus. So he's telling him who the individual is and that he is praying. And God has already given Saul a vision. In that vision, he has seen Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. This is a God appointment. God is speaking to Ananias about Saul. God has spoken to Saul about Ananias. <laughs> divine connection. God is making a divine connection. So beautiful. It's possible even today as we are doing the ministry. God is speaking to us about some somebody. God is speaking to them about us. And he says, go, Ananias, you go and you minister to him. So in verse 13, look at the answer of Ananias. He is just an ordinary disciple. So he says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. So who knows that believers those days had, you know, an information system uh, that they quickly passed on information about persecution. You know, today we have like WhatsApp and other things. We don't know what they had. Maybe Jerusalem Times or Jerusalem Post, some newspaper. He'd already read, this man is coming with photo, right? <laughs> Be careful. He's a persecutor. And, uh, uh, you know, like he has done a lot of harm to the saints in Jerusalem. So, underlying, it probably was written, Saul of Tarsus. So, the moment he heard Saul of Tarsus in the vision, he's scared now. Oh, my goodness, that man who's in the newspaper, you want me to go and meet him? God, are you sure? And he's trying to clarify to God that he's a persecutor. God, okay. And he has come here with permission, with authority from the chief priest to bind up those who call upon your name. So, Ananias knows where God is sending him. But the Lord said to him, Go, 
for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Verse 15. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So just look at this. God is encouraging Ananias. And do you remember earlier Saul asked God, Lord, what do you want me to do? And what did God tell him? You just go to Damascus, it will be told to you what you have to do. But what is te God telling Ananias? God is telling Ananias about the calling of Saul. Before Saul can understand, God is revealing it to another person. It's amazing. Saul doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Ananias is being told he's not an ordinary man. This man that I'm sending you to, he's a chosen vessel. He will bear my name before the Gentiles. We know that Saul was chosen as an apostle to the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. So his calling is being revealed to another man. Can God do that now? Revealing our calling to another person, revealing their calling to us. He can. He did it. So Ananias was told what this apostle or this man Saul is all about. So thank God Ananias was convinced at this point and he went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him he said brother Saul, brother Saul. This again we must understand this in those times whenever the early believers called a person brother it meant that that person was also a believer. You're part of the family of God. You're part of the body of Christ. So look at the obedience of Ananias. He had a vision. God told him to meet Saul of Tarsus. He knows that he's a persecutor, but God convinces him. Ananias is so obedient. He takes a risk. Okay, okay, God, I'll obey you. It's dangerous, but I'm going to Saul. So he goes there and he's also convinced that Saul is a believer. So that is why he calls him brother Saul. And what else happens once Ananias meets with Saul? <coughs> he says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he already has a background, a knowledge about what happened to Saul. How did he know that information? Maybe people were talking about it. We don't know. Maybe the Holy Spirit revealed it to him in a vision. We don't know. But he knew that Paul had an, Saul had an encounter. And he knows quite well why he even came there to meet with this man called Saul. One was to release healing for his blindness. Second was to pray over him so that he may be filled with the Holy Spirit. So can you notice the same pattern? He has a new believer and that person must be water baptized. That person must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that's the same thing that's happening towards uh, being done for Saul. So in verse 18, immediately there fell from the, his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. Okay, So Saul was healed. He was baptized in water. And we also understand that he was baptized in the Holy Spirit because that was the agenda with which Ananias came that day. So after all of this took place, he received food. He was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So now my question is, can a believer baptize a believer? We already know the answer to this question, but I'm asking again. Yeah, a believer can baptize another believer. Where did we see that? Philip's case. It's happening again. This is 
Ananias, a certain disciple in Damascus, Ananias. And God is working through him to water baptize as well as Holy Spirit baptism of Saul. Yeah, so there isn't a pattern, uh, Nina. We'll, we'll read about it in the very next chapter, chapter 10. There, what will happen is we will see that as people are listening to Peter's sermon, they will be Holy Spirit baptized before water baptism. So it, it's okay. This way or that way, it's okay as long as it's done. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so a believer can water baptize another believer. Second thing, notice over here, God is working through Ananias to minister to Saul. Okay. Who is Saul? He is a mighty apostle. We will see that he will write, you know, uh, uh, 13, or actually 14, if Hebrews is included, 14 books of the New Testament. Why did God send a Peter or a John? Why did God send Ananias? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So Nina is saying in God's eyes, everyone is the same. Of course, for God, he will use whom he... Huh? Different roles. Uh, as we said, he was an obedient man. He was an available man. So God just worked through him. So we can't tell that God will only use a mighty apostle to minister to a mighty apostle. Not necessary. An ordinary believer is the one who was chosen to first minister to Apostle Paul. To pray for baptism in the Holy Spirit. Ordinary believer went and prayed for Saul. That's how he got baptized. Okay. So these are all very beautiful insights for us to gain. Uh, and uh, again, the important point for us to note and follow is the obedience of Ananias. When God said, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. The obedience of Ananias should be the way we live our lives. When God speaks to us, we step out and we do what he wants us to do. Okay, so with this, we are going to stop today. There's a lot more to talk about Paul, what happened to him as soon as he accepted uh, Christ. But we'll take that up in the next class in, in great detail. Uh, for now, we've only spoken about the encounter that he had on the road to Damascus and uh, also how God sent Ananias to minister to him. Okay, Prince is asking, Ma'am, when a person came to comes to believe in Jesus, can he baptize himself? Okay, that's an interesting question. Never heard this question before, Prince. <laughs> no, but good one, good one that you thought of. Uh, from the way it is done in the Bible, baptism is a public proclamation. So how can there be a proclamation if we are alone? Baptizing ourselves. Nobody is watching. Nobody is seeing. There's got to be people seeing what has happened. Our faith in Christ. So, yeah, you, I, I don't think so. That's uh, uh, recommended, uh, Prince. There has to be another person to baptize us. I hope that's okay. <laughs> All right. Great. So if there are any other questions, let's take it up. If not, we'll uh, pray and close for today. That's it. Okay. So uh, then let's pray. Nikhil, could you please pray? Father, we thank you for this wonderful time, Lord. Once again, we come to your presence, Lord, and we thank you what we have studied, Lord Jesus. Give us knowledge, wisdom to understand more deeply about your word, Lord Jesus. Give a tribulation from your word, Lord. Thank you for teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, Prince has a question. I'll quickly address that. He says, for people of other faith, so that they, they don't want their family to know about their baptism, 
see even in that case their family need not be watching them but other believers should be watching them somebody has to be there as a witness so that's when it's uh, the right way to baptize okay so i hope that addresses your question thank you and thank you everyone god bless you we'll meet on friday